I do think that when things get really tough and I can take a moment and say, oh right, remember I'm supposed to walk with you today and you're there to take care of all my problems. There is a peace in that. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Today's guests show that when we stay closely connected to God and each other, we become better friends and better neighbors to the world. Entertainer Christian Chenoweth, Mr. Rogers' wife, Joanne Rogers, and pastor and R&B sensation, Montel Jordan. First up, Kristen Chenoweth is a star on the screen and on the stage. Growing up singing in church, Kristen is as comfortable singing in front of a choir as she is performing solos in Broadway plays. She talks with us about her varied career, one of her favorite gifts that actor-producer Rita Wilson gave her, and how her faith has always anchored her through every season of her life. I'm Kristen Chenoweth, self-admitted petite person, lover of donuts and dogs. Oh, and I also do Broadway and TV and film and movies and concerts and, yeah. I grew up in a tiny town in Oklahoma called Broken Arrow. I'm so thankful I grew up in the house that I did, and I happened to be an adopted child. But the truth is, you know, my mom and dad are my mom and dad. If you met them and you saw us all together, you would say, that's their kid. Growing up, that's when I learned to play the piano and I learned music, and I was just in my piano room writing and I was writing poetry and, you know, listening to music. And I don't know, that's when I really, first of all, came to understand what I wanted to do for a living. But that's when all the creativity was. Um, the best gift that they gave me probably is the, the gift that I think is the most important thing that you can give your child, which is self-esteem. Not to be confused with overconfidence, but just follow your passion and do it with all your might. Work hard, play hard. Um, love what you do. If you don't love it, life's short. Don't live beyond your means. All those things, stay humble. A smile goes a long way. Don't sweat the small stuff. That, those are the kinds of things that I heard growing up that helped me a lot. My parents moved to Pennsylvania when I was at OCU in college, so I kind of got a little bit of graduation into the East Coast, but there's nothing that's going to prepare you from New York. I just remember walking down the street when I moved there and I was just saying hi to everybody. Well, hi, hi. And people were like, what? What? Move. You know, I just didn't know. Like, have your money ready when you're going to pay. You know, people will yell at you. Um, But now I've become a New Yorker. I'm like, gosh, what? Taurus, like, go faster. And I go back to Oklahoma, and my mom's like, you need to slow down. Like, we're in line at McDonald's, and they're going to check out their time, and you need to slow down. You need to remember your roots. So my grandma, Mildred Chenoweth, um, Grandma Chenny is what I called her. She was a great mentor to me because I can remember walking in when I was a little girl and from the you know being out in the farm and being dirty and her her being really strict like you got you got to get in the tub you got to you got to help with dinner let's let's unload the dishwasher let's load the dishwasher let's okay now let's watch TV we did things together. And then that stayed with me up until through college and when I go there on the weekends sometimes to do my laundry. And my grandma, for example, this tells a lot about who she is, when she passed away, um, we were looking through her stuff, and she didn't always say to me, you're just so good, and look at this news article, and I'm so proud of you. I knew she loved me. But when she passed away, I saw in her closet a big stack of all of the newspaper articles and magazines I've done. She'd clipped and saved them. And then when she passed away, her Bible, we looked, me and my cousins looked through it, and every margin was filled with comments or questions that she had for God. Like, she wasn't just a studier of the Bible. She really talked and thought about it, and she wrote her thoughts in the margins. And when she wrote questions in the margins, they were literally questions like, I don't understand this, remind me to talk to pastor about it. And I think that's what God wants us to do when we read the Bible. How does this apply to me? And make sure you understand it. To this day, I'm calling my mom going, "Uh, this doesn't make sense to me, just because I still want to talk about it. I want to know. Knowledge is power. And sometimes it's not even so much that we can understand it, but it might hit us later. So a lot of people say you should do your prayer or meditation or whatever, your quiet time, whatever that is for you in the morning. But for me, it's a nighttime thing. I can't sleep. So that is one thing that calms me. 
gives me peace. It's amazing, again, when you get quiet and you turn off the TV and you quit allowing yourself to ping pong your brain and get online and answer 45 things and do social media. Social media is a big one for me because it's part of my business too. But getting off of that and just reading the word, praying, 15 minutes. I mean, it can be five minutes. It can be an hour. It, it's never like timed by me. It's just what it is, how it feels. But for me, it happens at night. And when I don't do it, I can tell a difference in my week. And um, yeah, that's why I like Jesus Calling, because I, I get the app and I can read it every day before I start. And I tend to read it at night before I go to bed too. So Rita gave it to me. And this was, I want to say, 10 years ago. And it has been my, my constant. And uh, I just wonder sometimes, we're good friends, but I wonder sometimes if she knows just how much that gift continues to give to me. I tell her a lot, and she's like, or she'll text me, did you read Jesus Calling today? Oh my gosh, it was written for me today. And that's what I feel. It's almost like every day you read it, you go, oh my gosh, that's exactly what I needed. And um, it always seems to fit. I've given it to so many people. I just recently gave it to my boyfriend because he lost his copy, and I think it's important when you traveled it. I have, I have one in my bag about this big. I've given it to one of my best friends who's just the, the most amazing girl, and she's Jewish. Her heritage is Jew Jewish, and I said, just read it. It's, it's just an inspirational guide for you every day, and she loves it. Um, I've given the really little ones out to different cast members on Broadway, just like, just read it. And I think it's a question and a conversation worth having with the people that you love, whether they believe like you or not. So I'd like to read about joy, and um, this comes on the date, January 3rd. There's much joy in here, but it says, Be still and know that I am God. Most Christians are familiar with this command, but not so many take it seriously. Yet for those who do, blessings flow like streams of living water. As these believers sit in stillness, focusing on me and my word, their perception of me expands and their troubles shrink in importance. That is the truth. My troubles do shrink when I think, think about the word. I want you to share in these blessings, beloved. Take time, take time with me. I was just talking about this. See what I mean? Remember, my word is a lamp to guide your feet and a light for your path. Biblical thinking illuminates the path before you so you can find your way. It's crucial to know not only that I am God, but that I made you and you are mine. My favorite part of this whole thing is, it's crucial to know not only that I am God, but that I made you and you are mine. I think in this life, in this business, especially this industry, faith of some kind is going to work for you. I had a bad accident like seven years ago uh, on the set of a TV show and I heard action and woke up in the hospital and I had lots of injuries but mainly what I had was time, time to heal and I, I don't always do great with like leaving left to my own thoughts because I'm a, I'm a constant doer you know but I believe that sometimes things happen to you so that you that God can speak because sometimes you can't hear when you get too busy and that is a challenge I have still to this day in my life it's like get too busy can't hear what I'm supposed to hear and when there's all this you can't hear like my mom keeps saying you got two ears and one mouth listen twice as hard and I don't think God makes things happen to you but I think sometimes he allows things to happen to you so you can you have to get down on your knees and say help and it was hard because I was in pain, but also I didn't want to just be there healing. I wanted to be doing something. I couldn't sing. I couldn't dance. I couldn't act. I couldn't do, I could hardly move. And for a long time, my words were kind of not there on the tip of my tongue because of the, the getting hit in the brain. So it was a lot of prayer and a lot of just like, are you there, God? And then it was, oh, yeah, you're there, God. And then it was, and I'm here now, too. Like, it was like a three-step. So I knew that I had kind of gotten so busy. And whenever that ha starts to happen to me now, which is all the time I, I get there, I go, oh, right, remember. Think, quiet, listen. It's a good lesson. My process in life is slower. My process in learning music and roles I do is slower 
but I think the work is better because of it, because I'm taking the time. One of Kristen's greatest joys in life is giving back with some of the things she's learned over her years in entertainment and working with others to help them bring their music and art to the world. She shares some of the special memories she made with her talented friends on her latest studio album, For the Girls, and also how she helps up-and-coming young performers find their unique talents with her annual Broadway boot camp. Well, when I was setting out to do a new record, this was two years ago after Art of Elegance came out, I was like, what am I going to do now, you know? And I just made a list of all the songs I wanted to do, and I realized a lot of them were famous women singer-songwriters. And I thought, it's just turning out to be that. I didn't set out to make a female strong album, but when you look at your material and that's what's inspiring you, you're going to do it. You know, we're talking about Dinah Washington, Barbara Streisand, Judy Garland, but we're also talking about Eva Cassidy, um, Edie Gourmet, uh, Dolly. We're talking about Carole King, Patsy Cline, which was very scary for me because all I can hear is her version in my head of crazy. Linda Ronstadt, that, you know, it was all over the map for me growing up. and I wanted to celebrate them. Then I thought, who do I want? You know, it's for the girls. It's kind of what evolved. I would love to have a couple girls on there. Who would I want? Well, I'll never get her, but I want Dolly. I'll never get her, but I want Reba. Jennifer Hudson, I'm not going to get her because she's so busy, but she's my buddy. Maybe she'll say yes. Ariana, who I've watched grow up, she's she's too busy. She's on tour. She's not going to do it. And they all said yes. It felt like a culmination of all the work I've done all these years. A few of the people that I think are the best singers in the planet went, we see you, and we're gonna, we want to do it. I think it's important when you, when you have been given opportunities and had success, you then need to give it to the people behind you. I have the Christian Channel the Arts and Education Fund, and what we do is a lot of shows at the theater that they named after me in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. They built a state-of-the-art performing arts center, and they named the theater the Christian Channel Theater. And at first I thought, oh, what am I going to do with that? It's my name. It's my dad's name. It's my grandpa's name. But when you see it so beautifully done in such a beautiful building, you think, you better do something with it. And I started a Broadway boot camp. And this year, past year, was our fifth year. Lots of kids audition. I can only take about 50. And it's a full week at Tony Ward week time. We start with a pizza party and we watch the Tony Awards in my theater with a big screen. And the next day starts the intensive boot camp, which is singing, acting, and dancing. And at the end of the week, we put on a show. I bring in a lot of my famous friends, singers, actors, dancers, to help teach. We have a director and we do a show and the kids love it. When they get together at camp, and they know nobody. And then by the end of the week, they're best friends and crying and holding on to each other. That is what I live for. Whether they become an accountant, an executive, a writer, a mom, a dad, I want them to do it with aplomb. I want them to do it with, with learning and taking this, this experience with them for the rest of their life. This is what I live for. I want them to soar in whatever they choose. Even when I make a mistake, I want them to see because a, nobody's perfect. B, we don't always make the right decision. And C, how are you going to handle it? I want them to know that I'm willing to learn from them. I want to learn from them. If I keep teaching what I know, I will learn too. To check out Kristen's latest projects or to see if she'll be performing near you, check out her website at officialkristenchenoweth.com. We'll be right back with a bonus interview from Joanne Rogers, the wife of Mr. Rogers, who talks about the film featuring Tom Hanks, who plays Mr. Rogers, after this brief message about two holiday projects from Kristen Chenoweth that will debut on television this holiday season. Kristen Chenoweth stars as a youth choir director who needs to write a big song for a Christmas Eve show, but is distracted when a boy with a golden voice joins her choir, which comes as a surprise to his widowed father. I play a choir director who used to be a Broadway star, but gave it all up for to have her kids' choir. And a kid comes in from across town, and it's him being integrated in his choir and what it means and who he is to her and who she is to him and how it all unfolds. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. And naturally, with Hallmark, it looks beautiful. Don't miss A Christmas Love Story, debuting on the Hallmark Channel on December 7th. 
And you'll love hearing Kristen singing carols in concert with one of the most celebrated choirs in the world. I'm very proud of it. It's both classical in nature and, you know, soft pop. We have a Karen Carpenter song in there. We have Mary Did You Know. We have a lot of the great Christmas things. We have a lot of more classical singing that I got the, to go back again to my roots and do. Kristen Chenoweth's Christmas concert with the Tabernacle Choir will air during the holidays on PBS. Right now, the world is hungry for stories of kindness. And who better to share in a story of kindness than America's favorite neighbor? Tom Hanks portrays Mr. Rogers in the brand new film, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, based on the true life story of a real friendship between Fred Rogers and jaded journalist Tom Juneau. Today, we're honored to welcome Mrs. Rogers, who is Fred's beloved wife, Joanne, to learn a little bit more about the man behind the cardigan. Hi, I'm Joanne Rogers. I am a, I am a mom and a grandmom, and I was Fred Rogers' wife. We met in college, uh, we, uh, at Rollins College in Florida. He was a transfer from Dartmouth and came down to Rollins because Dartmouth didn't have a music school at that time. And he had decided that he wanted to major in music. And uh, so I, I was already at Rollins for one year when he arrived, and I was a piano major. He was a composition major in music. He had a double major. He majored in music and in uh, language, in French. He was very good at languages. So anyway, that's where we met, and the friendship developed. And, uh, uh, I graduated and went on to uh, another school for graduate study in, in piano. And Fred, when he graduated from Rollins, then went up to New York to work for NBC, it, it was a kind of an apprenticeship for a couple of years there. We would just write back and forth and sometimes talk, but not very often, and we were both so busy. And so we didn't see each other much, and, and then suddenly I got a letter asking me to be married. Uh, to him, that is, <laughs> to say. So I quickly said yes, and we were married in... July of 1952. We did have a very good friendship, which I think is very important for young married people. When he was really at the height of his popularity, the question that would often be asked of me, what's it like to be married to Mr. Rogers? And I would say it's like anybody else's wife. Fred had pretty uh, regular hours in the studio. He would get home uh, around 5.30, maybe, and he would say, give me 20 minutes. And he'd have a little lie down, and that would be enough for him, a little, little nap. <laughs> and then he was an early go-to-bedder. He got up at 5.15 in the morning. He did his prayer routine and, and then went to swim and before going to the studio. So all that got done early in the morning. He was a morning person. He worked hard for everything and felt responsibility for it. His program was his ministry. He was ordained to do that by the church. You know, he said the space between the person who's speaking into the screen and the person on the other side of the screen who's watching, that is sacred space. And that was important to him. Everything is so divisive right now. Someone said to me he would be on his soapbox, and I said, oh, no, I don't think so. He would just be doing, walking the walk, and trying to do what he could with reconciliation. I think he would do what he could to build on what hope there is, and I think it would be very important to him because he was very involved in reconciliation. And I think that would be his first interest, is just trying to get people to reconcile with each other. A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood movie releases in theaters nationwide on November 22nd. 
in the mid-90s, R&B artist Montel Jordan was living the high life, celebrating a new marriage and a number one smash hit single called This Is How We Do It. Montel began to lose touch with the values he grew up with and fell into a life that was more about partying than building lasting relationships. It took one of Montel's friends to hold him accountable before Montel realized he needed to turn his life around. Today, Montel and his wife, Kristen, minister to other couples in crisis and help them realize restoration is possible for them if they work on their relationship each day and trust God as the foundation of their lives. Hey, everybody. I am Montel Jordan. I am an executive pastor at a church in uh, Atlanta, Georgia called Victory World Church. I was a former R&B recording artist, Grammy-nominated, and uh, went into full-time ministry in 2011. And I'm now looking to do quite a bit more uh, musically and with my wife uh, in marriage ministry. Uh, I was uh, born uh, in 1968, Los Angeles, California, a lower middle class family, oldest child of four. I have a younger brother and two younger sisters, uh, fantastic parents. I was brought up as a church kid was a child musician playing piano in my church around the time I was nine or 10 years old. And so uh, we lived, eat, slept, breathed church regularly. Uh, and that was the foundation uh, of my upbringing. And I would say that uh, a lot of times I was in church, but church wasn't always in me. Uh, and I say that from the standpoint of I knew all the technical things to do about being in church, the musical things to do about being in church. But in regard to having a real personal relationship with Jesus or or being uh, in tune with what the Holy Spirit was, all those things were foreign to me. A lot of those uh, church musicians that I worked with back at that time would eventually become my band members and producers of the hit records that I would uh, later start having in my musical career. Uh, but uh, brought up uh, on the West Coast and had musical sensibilities as a child from everything of R&B music from Luther Vandross and Morris Day in the Time and Prince and Michael Jackson and Lionel Richie to a lot of the early pop music, Phil Collins and and Cyndi Lauper. And music for me early on was a, a strange dichotomy simply because being brought up in church, but having world music sensibilities were always very taboo uh, in the time period that, that I was coming up. Then I started experimenting with different styles of music, with pop music and country music and R&B music all the way up through college. And that's what started to lead me towards the fusing of hip hop and R&B music. I uh, was working a job after college, uh, preparing to go to law school and, and just really felt like, man, if I'm ever going to take a crack at this music business, now is going to be the time. And so I stacked up uh, as much money as I could and tucked away in a little apartment and created a demo tape. It made its way into the hands of, of Russell Simmons at Def Jam Records, who was trying to expand uh, his label out to the West Coast. Uh, he kind of deemed me his West Coast documentary rap singer. And the moment I got a record deal, one of the first songs I started recording was This Is How We Do It. And it would uh, become my first single. It would become my first number one record. It would become Def Jam's first uh, number one record and would go on to uh, sell millions of records and 20 something years later still be uh, something that marked a period of time and still seems to do that to this day. Everything changed for me having a, a number one record as your first record out of the box. I didn't recognize that great success did not come with an instruction manual. There was no textbook saying, hey, here's what you do when you get large amounts of money. Here's how you should spend it. Here's how you should invest. And that a lot of the music business is based on perpetual debt, uh, that you, you basically owe the record label albums and money and everything is recoupable. I learned that word recoupment early on uh, in the process. And through that, I basically would get the fame and the accolades and most of the money I would be going to the record labels and writers and producers. Life changed because I got married maybe a couple of months right before my song hit. I didn't know how to do marriage well. I didn't know how to be a good husband, uh, but I knew how to do artistry. And so I put that at the forefront over our marriage. I want to say it was either 1995 or, or 1996, I think it was, 
that I was only at home in my own bed 13 days out of the year. I was on the road the en entire other portion of the year. And so if you can imagine only being in your own bed 13 days out of a year, that has to take its toll on a marriage. And so it started me down a pretty dark road of relationships and friendships that were outside of my marriage, cheating, adultery, all of those things that were hidden. And so uh, it came to a head where someone who was a close family friend and one of our business associates loved us enough to expose me, uh, to basically say, I can't do this anymore. Uh, our friendship cannot continue like this. If you don't share this with your wife, with my friend, then we can't go on. I said, I would rather tell and lose everything or lose half of everything in this process uh, rather than losing my life. And that was where everything kind of came to a, a head of me telling her what was going on in our marriage and in my life. She asked me to leave the house. The same person that caused me to, to expose my indiscretions to my wife was also the same person that asked my wife, uh, what is God telling you to do in the situation? But when she asked God, what did he want her to do? Uh, he asked her to stay and said that um, her life and my daughter's life would depend on her staying. I would say the rebuilding of trust process that that began is a process that still continues to this very day. It, it was something that just to fast forward, you know, to this day, we have a great marriage. We do marriage ministry together. Like we have very strong kids and, and grandkids. We're in the faith, we're in ministry. It hasn't been like it, it took us a year to recover. Like we are still regularly recovering to make sure that we maintain uh, what God restored. As we started coming to the, the getting closer to what ministry life would look like, she had been doing ministry, dealing with helping write books and being a part of, of women's ministry, speaking into young girls' lives. And me, I was still the, the recording artist going out, traveling. We had been navigating through a bankruptcy. Uh, I like to call it a wilderness period of time where we were basically surviving on day-to-day -day provision from God, somehow making a way. And as more and more music industry doors started to close, label opportunities started to close, the ministry door started to open. And it was, I guess, said that when God closes a door, no man can open it. And when he opens a door, no man could close it. Uh, someone had asked us one day uh, in, a, in a youth group that we were a part of, a young adult group, hey, what are you guys passionate about? And we were like, oh, we don't know. You know, <laughs> and they were like, well, what are you, what are you good at? And I guess, well, we've been really working on our marriage and they were like, okay, great. You should be teachers on marriage. And if we get together a, a group of a couple of other married couples, can you guys speak into their lives? And so we're like, well, yeah, I guess. And so we went and we created a message and they said, Hey, that was really good. Uh, can you do part two of it? Can you do part three of it? Can you do part four of it? And so we spent, you know, a year where the first quarter we did a, a message that had like 11 couples in the room. And then when we came back for part two, we had like 20 couples in the room. We got to part three, we had like 44 couples in the room. And by the time we got to the one at the end of the year, we had like 70 couples in the room. And it just kept kind of expanding that, hey, maybe this is something that people need. And, and our story is something that makes sense to uh, people who are navigating through landmines and fields that we've already crossed. So Every instance that God brought us through, it allows us to give more insight to others who are either coming out of it or still in the midst of that struggle in their own marriages. And so we become like a lighthouse or a template for people that, you know, most lighthouses are not on land. They're actually built on rock, but they're actually out in the midst of the storms, you know, still out in the water. And so we're trying to allow couples to be able to see, even if you're in that storm, a lighthouse is to help guide you back to shore, back to the rock, back to, to safety uh, in God. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, reach a million marriages. We felt like if we can start at that place, uh, 
you know, one couple at a time or as many as we as God will allow us to reach that we're willing to to invest that time into couples and into people who desire to be married. In the midst of his duties as a husband, father, and pastor, Montel still makes time to create music. Recently, he released a new album, and he talks about the brand new single he called When I'm Around You, and why he was excited to collaborate on it with his friend, Christian hip-hop artist Lecrae. Uh, the new album is called Masterpiece, and it is a R&B album. Do you hear me talking about him restoring marriage? And uh, if you're not a spiritual person. It just sounds like a fantastically, a highly encouraging album promoting love between couples. But I don't shy away from God on the album. I just didn't want to say it's an album for the church. It's an album from the church for the world. And so the same world that I reached before, I'm trying to reach them now with family and, and marriage and promise and faithfulness and still do it over hot records. That's what the album is. I'm excited about it. And the first song came about uh, because Lecrae uh, and I are friends. My wife, Kristen, and, and Dara, his wife, are friends. We travel together. We do life together. Iron sharpens iron together. And as my friend, I, I normally wouldn't ask my friend to do that. It just so happens that I have a friend who's one of the hottest rappers on the planet. And so uh, I, I stepped out of the box and said, hey, would you be willing to do this? And he uh, accepted and his label allowed uh, us to be able to to work together. We all are in some ways reinvented. I think it's different when we reinvent ourselves and when God reinvents us. And I've been through the process of trying to reinvent myself and finally uh, allowing him to create in me what he's probably been desiring for my life long, long ago. And I think what's cool about music now for me is that um I can create love songs uh, from the one who knows more about love uh, than anybody else. Hey, who got my heart for forever? It's you. you. Who held me down, made me better? It's you. you. Was slipping in my eyes, had me tripping. I was living like I didn't recognize. It's a privilege, but true. Love is hard to find in this day and time. People lying, don't nobody want to be tied down. But you got me on the roast for it. It's a rap, so you know I probably wrote for it. Yeah, I'm old school like gazelles with the fat laces. I still believe the chivalry is that basic. I open up the door of my heart, let you in while my man Montel sings part like You can follow Montel Jordan on social media to find out more information about his music and marriage resources. If you like these kinds of stories about spreading love to friends and neighbors, check out our interview with radio host Delilah. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we talk with author, speaker, and leadership coach John Maxwell. When you look at John's vibrant career, it's hard to deny his incredible success. But John says he gained wisdom not from his successes, but from something else. I've learned a lot more from my failures than I have from my successes. You know, when I'm succeeding, it's kind of like, let's just celebrate and aren't we wonderful? But when I'm failing, I'm saying, okay, there's something's wrong here. I gotta, I got, I've, I've, I've got to figure this out. And, and, and so what I really teach people all the time is to fail forward. That as you fall, just go th- three feet, <laughs> fall forward and get back up and you've already gained three. And all my life, I've done a lot of, of failing forward. Do you love hearing these stories of faith weekly from people like you whose lives have been changed by a closer walk with God? then be sure to subscribe to the Jesus Calling Stories of Faith podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you like what you're hearing, leave us a review so that we can reach others with these inspirational stories. And you can also see these interviews on video as part of our original web series, with a new interview premiering every other Sunday on Facebook Live. Find previously broadcast interviews on our YouTube channel, on IGTV, or on JesusCalling.com slash video.